go. Some of you know this guy. May know this guy. Winston Churchill. I'm a little bit into history of politics. That's why I choose to start with him. No. Now, pretty much at the end of his life, you know, he was prime minister and successful and he helped win the award and stuff. And he was invited to come to a ceremony for um, honoring uh, the new, new young officers in the Navy. So a big room full of maybe 200 young lieutenants. And the um, old man was, he just woke up to the stage. He looked at them, it was very, very quiet, very quiet. He just gave him one word. He said, He said, never, never give up. He bowed. You turn around. For me, it's a very good idea for talking to yourself and talking to us in resilience. Never give up. I mean, it's a, in very short phrase, resilience, we a burned in story. Now, I looked at a little bit of the internet, which is today a possibility. possibility. Uh, we'll put all the presentations on video on YouTube, so you can look at them. So just a few of them. There's hundreds of them. <coughs> so just give Google resilience and find a lot of stuff. Quite good stuff. Interesting. If you want that. Um, sometimes, when you work with your clients, and if you are a young coach or an old therapist, it doesn't really matter here. Sometimes it helps to tell people stories. Let's call them metaphors, let's call them code quotes, whatever. And some people will look at them. For some of them, you write it up. You say, ah, yes. Because some people just need some auditory guidance or some verbal guidance. Good idea. So, what I'm going to. Okay, that's me. I'm not married, I'm married well. There's a big difference, you know. My wonderful wife will come tonight. Um, this is basically it just means um, that I raised my hand off enough to get a ticket. That's all. Uh, because some people are so shy they never raised their hand, so that's why they don't have papers. Or it's my dear friend Birgit, who, who is uh, the originator of the word burn on in her story. Uh, they don't have, in Germany we say Lappen, you have pieces of paper. Yeah. So I raised my hand sufficient enough to get enough pieces of paper, that's all. Yeah. And uh, yes, I have all these funny credentials that about. that. In 1980 I learned to fly, and since then of course I'm connected with flying. Now there's no more flying because of this funny story here. But, um, this is, I guess, a very good approach to understanding of where NLP came from. It did not come from theory, it came from practice. Different type of practice. Maybe sometimes the practice of Mr. Mandela and uh, John Grinder were uh, induced by cocaine. At least that's what Grinder told me some 20 years ago. But whatever, it was practice. And NLP also started from that. And it developed, and eventually NLP came out even if the founders didn't want it. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so... Uh, um, if you sit in the cockpit, you need to, do, to look at two things, two sides. You need to look outside to see the weather, the storms and other traffic. You need to look inside on your own instruments. It's not either or, it's both. You need both. So when you coach people, when you do therapy with people, when you work with people, your leadership with people, whatever you call it, you have both sides, outside and internal. And you just have and it's differentiated. Because outside there's lots of stories, 
inside the bubbles first. That's why we need a lot of training uh, in working with people to understand our own dynamics. Quick story here, which for me goes to resilience and Berlin. So you know those guys, Sherlock Holmes and Watson, and they get a task to find some bad people in the Scottish High Moor. And in the Scottish Moor, they have uh, a funny weather there. At night, it's really cold, very cold. And during the day, it's very hot. And at night, it rains a lot. So there's no hotels, no pubs, no bed and breakfast. They take a tent. So in the morning, you know, Sherlock Holmes kicks Watson and said, Watson, Dr. Watson, what do you see? What do you make of it? And Holmes, you know, Watson rubs his ass and said, oh, I see millions of stars. Astronomical means we're many light years away from the next galaxy. And uh, theologically, it seems God is so powerful, Church of England. And um, small light to the big universe we are. And horologically, time wise, it seems it's uh, quarter to three. And meteorologically, the stars are so bright, it means tomorrow we have good weather. And then the home starts to be a little funny. He says, and what does it mean to you, Mr. Holmes? And Mr. Holmes says, it's good if he's smart there. It was one of the best voted jokes. And for our work with LP, for me, that's a key story, especially also working with uh, resilience and all this figures around. This 25 minute story here should give you some, some inputs, some thinking inputs. Because whenever people <coughs> have an issue, this is what do they experience? And at the level of experience, there can be very different mistakes, uh, deviations, reductions, whatever. And then, what meaning do they give to it? Because if they see a strong man, either they will not see him, or only will see his legs or his arms, and they will give, say, oh, there's a strong man, must be Nazi, who was God man, he will protect me, or you know, whatever. Yeah. So one story is, what do the people see? And what people is, what story is, what meaning do the people give to it? And we as our peers have to work with that if we get it. And also for us as our peers, when the client comes in the first time, now what do we see and what do we make of it? And this is a little bit looked at in good LMP trainings. Maybe not enough, or maybe yes, we can argue of course. And uh, for me, it's a basic story in all applied psychology. So, what's the, what do you perceive and what's the meaning? <laughs> the original story, I understand why, 75, many years ago, Dr. Chomsky, John Green did that. A meta communication jargon, this subjective, uh, the study of the subjective experience. Yes, scientifically, yes. Completely unusable with normal people. That's why also Catalina used applied psychology. For me, LP is applied psychology. And it's a big field. It's not just a very small field, it's a big field. We've been there. Perception meaning. Check that. So when you go into resilience work with people, you as a coach or some perverted, have really to see what's the perception, what's the meaning between you and with the person and his society. And the key question of course is what's the difference between white magic white white magic and black magic? Any answer here? Just one word. One word. Give me one, one answer. One word. Huh? 
Simple, simple and good. A word that even a 10 year old can understand. Colors. Color, exactly, the attitude, the color. Yep. Black and white is a color. And so, it's not about technique. Technique, yeah. It's not so technique. I can use the same NLP techniques to heal somebody or to seduce somebody. That's the difference. You can analyze all the techniques of various presidents who just got elected from an NLP perspective. It's not about the techniques. So the attitude, behind it, two people. Same with resilience. And resilience work. What attitude do we have there? And what I also think is very important if you work with people, some of my friends know this frame, of course, <coughs> is this story. We have everybody who comes in, especially clients who have sufferings, who have low resistance. There's many funny words. Um, you have a balance always, and sometimes the balance is continuously on a not good level. And where problems are, problems get more. Of course you always get good sides also. But if the dynamic is always bad story, bad story, bad story, bad story it's running up. So you have to understand when you work with resilience with people, how do you slowly, eventually, slowly change in the person, maybe also you, of course, <laughs> if your training hasn't been as good, uh, the dynamic of influx and outflux that some of you may, go, may be good in mathematics, you can calculate that. It's, it's very, very, you can make algorithms and whatever. But, and the key story to work with resilience also maybe this here, that you change from this level to eventually to this level, that you go in balance. And after maybe one hour or five years, this depends on your ability and the client situation and background. I mean, to, if you work with people in um, Syria right now, I'm not sure if that is done after one after, after one hour. You know? Even in a refugee camp, it may take three years. Yes. It depends what kind of mess is there. And eventually, if you really work successfully, I'm not talking about happy client in one hour. That's it. Criminal fantasy, most of them, for people who are resilient. <coughs> Eventually, that's, that could be an outcome. It's a structural outcome. <laughs> that people continuously is able and willing to look on the good side of the life and not so much focus to get in the best stories. Um, has it a lot of behavioral and attitude uh, development and take, may take time. And also it's a challenge for you as a LP specialist here. Another question which is rarely looked at in LP courses is the question of normality. Now some of the pictures are here a little bit shocking. I'm sorry. The question is what normality is normal for you and for the client? If you have uh, customers clients from a different culture. Let's say you have one of these hard jawed military yes question. Can you what normality do you have? And what normality does the client have? Uh, so if, uh, if you have one of these uh, hardcore, highly procedural, very precise uh, officers from your army, general staff, infantry, yeah? Now this person has a lot of very different normalities than a lady with uh, uh, five children from four men um, without any school education. Just to give you some extreme examples. Yeah? Um, or somebody who worked for 10 years in the Enbin prison in Tehran as a hangman. Yeah? They are people, they all have human rights. They may have very different normalities. Normal in what they believe in. Okay? And I, I know, I've, I've had examples here. I worked as a strong therapist. No. So. Anybody been to Australia? 
there? I mean, you know, there, they have no mobile phones there on some areas because they have no transmitters. For three, I mean, they have motorways 500 kilometers. It doesn't just doesn't pay to have a mobile phone transmitters there. And towns yes, they have, of course. So that's normal for them. Let's see one, we're normal to have on all our roads, our mobile phones. There's different normalities. They don't even criticize it. It's normal there. And it's good to understand it. Or let's put it in my heart. My dear colleague, Catherine. Yeah, you have a good smile. This is absolutely possible in Hamburg or in Stockholm. Yeah? We did a conference, like this conference about four years ago in Marseille. I didn't believe it, this picture. And I said, yes, it's possible. They have a very uh, different approach to rules and regulations. That's what this way. Different normality. So if you have one um, North German LMP coach um, who, for some miraculous reason, speaks good French and goes to further France, he will see a lot of different normalities, not only in food, but in behavior or time wise. Like if we would do a conference in Finland. Nobody would be here 10 minutes before 9. Everybody would be here 2 minutes before 9. In Finland, it's normal. Here, to be punctual on time is a different concept. I'm not criticizing, it's just different amount yeah? Then we can hide it in the culture. Or, now those of you who work with children start screaming now and say, take this away, take your children away from those parents. No, it's holy, it's a red temple. It's absolutely normal there. Okay? So better get used to the normality of people. Otherwise, uh, small putsi problem, as they say in Romanian. Yeah? Or, just another shocking picture. The snake has eaten already. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Thailand. It could be normal. So, one work aspect in working with people and resilience and other stories is find out what is their normality. And um, if you're very clear-cut, orderly, nice human being doing LP training, you this may you may not be used to that aspect. So. <coughs> also, in social behavior is the person used to be lonely, to be alone, and it's to be alone good for him and not and normal for him. For some people, it is. And for some people, this is normality <laughs> in Japan. Now, from a Central European perspective, we can say, oh, this is better, this is worse, than the that. My question is here just, which normality do you think, as a coach, is normal and which is not? Also health-wise. And this is a big story here. And we have to look at that and see how do we go about it. So if you have, if you're a coach that likes this approach, and your client likes this approach, it may become interesting, or other way around, whatever. Or you work in teams well, or you always go for a fight. Um, it really depends on your concept of normality and other people's normality. And that is where the war starts, if normalities are different. And the question is, are you as a good LMP coach, maybe a psychotherapist, able to withstand different normalities of course, when it gets criminal, it's like, okay, I'm torturing children, I'm torturing old people, I guess, okay, we can't have this on that. But there's a lot of fields which are legal, not criminal, which are basically acceptable, okay, in society. So how do we work with these clients when they have different normalities when it comes to resilience? It's just a little side story in LP, LPT, because it also shows you when you're working with this, what also you have to cover. So, I love elephants. I'm very respectful. I don't come closer because I can't run anymore. And elephants are stronger than me, of course. Yeah? Okay, so people say, Peter, you behave like an elephant, fair enough. But, uh, <laughs> so, the basis in this applied psychology called LMP, LMPT, is the anchors, the skeleton. That's what we learned very early. 
I guess with maybe one, two months. Things get anchored automatically, all the time. And some naive LBs believe everything is anchoring, which I think is not a good description. So, and then there's the cognitive behavioral side, which is important. I respect my behavioral clients. They're wonderful in writing papers. They're great. Yeah? I, I wish there would be more written papers in LP, published papers in good journals. They're very good at they, they, they live, they, love, they publish or perish, sorry. And then we have the intestines, the psychodynamic. Very good, good form. So you know, it's basically around parts work and all that stuff. Parts work, relief, change, and that. That's the intestine work. And we have to be able to do that. Sometimes resilience work helps that we have to adapt to things here. It takes slow. Anchoring can go quick. Inner work goes slow. And then we have the systemic thinking. How is everything connected with everything? The nervous system. Also an approach you have to have in your unconscious competence when you work with people. And there's a language issue in OMP. Really, it's not only in the it's also lingo. You know? So it's a good idea to understand what people say and how specifically they say it. And sometimes it helps. Or what is their body language saying? And do you interpret the body language in a good way? Also a challenge. Or how do, they, do you interpret the pauses or the eyes? So what is the language expression a person has? It's also part of NLP work very well with uh, this uh, resilience work, quantum work. And the elephant needs food. And the client needs a goal. No goal, not good. And also, if the goal that you as a resilience worker have is different than the goal that the clients have, then the war starts. And war is generally funny if you win it. Otherwise, it's not funny. And then, this is what all the simple LPS love so much. And then, we say some words and people close their eyes. And all the hypnosis stuff. I love it. It's great. Hypnosis is wonderful. Super. Yeah? The presentation form. The presentation form of many forms of LMP is hypnotic. And if you look at the elephant skin here, Maybe you follow trance, wonderful. And B has very often tired, but not always a hypnotophoretic surface. And all that together makes the elephant for resilience work. Also, which is a little bit that we teach a lot and also in Virginia, we call it the, the, the balance of life type topics there. Yeah? You can call it LP anthropology, but it's just the words. I think there's four things. It was developed before the work by, there's this thing called work-life balance. We developed this a bit before, but I guess five years before. So, you have to work to resolve the cognitive side. It's important. If you have a finished degree, you need a lot of work to that. The structure and the order. This is for all our friends to do the constellation work. Uh, they need to be competent. Uh, could be a family structure, could be a business uh, structure, military structure, church structure, uh, training structure. What is the order of things? The hierarchies. The first story develops when a child is born. The relationship story, hopefully. Hopefully the relationship is good. The relationship is always a combination of these two things. I love you, and this is that's the rules. For a child, you would say, don't bite me in the nose. You know? Those you know, the, little terrorists. You know? they, they, they need some friendly rules. And then, of course, there's the, the area of fun and humor and jokes. I mean, for me, LMP's new laughing program. Yeah, in human. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, and this, this is the balance, so you need the balance of those four. So 
So when we work with uh, resiliency to see now which area is well developed and which area may need some upgrade. It's a combination. Uh, we put it on YouTube, you can get it. Yeah? So, and uh, it takes work. This is not now methodology, this is more concept. Of course, also is the person more on short, a uh, short-term person like this one? It's okay, it's okay. I mean, in LMP, I tell my students, you can do everything you want in life, you just have to live with the consequences. And some people are not even willing to look at the consequences, which creates some stupid stories. But, okay. Or do you go long-term? I mean, for doing resilience, uh, running or body movement is probably a good idea. Of course, if it's medically checked. And uh, relationship, we have heard that before. Party, you know, it's, I think it's river dance, whatever. So, all that's important. So when you work with people with resilience, directly, one-to-one, -one, street fight, I call it. I did martial arts when I was young, I'm fitter. Um, they always say, well, in street fight, you have to do this. Well, in one-to-one in -one work with people, you have to have all in the background, you know, minimal intervention. Where do I ask my question and where is the story? And where do I get the resources? Because all these can be resources or lots of good stories. It depends. Yeah, of course, family, network. Life has changed a lot. 150 years ago, everybody had uh, if the mothers were lucky, seven or eight children. If the mothers were not lucky, the mothers died with the first child. Da, da, da. And uh, you had a pneumonia, an inflammation of the lung. 60%, 80% of people died straight from pneumonia because there was no penicillin. Yeah? So family structures have changed a lot. We can argue, but I just described. And yes, it's good to know how to work with internet books and read books and facts and all that. I'm not against it. Some, some people in LMP world are LMP phobic, are, are research phobic, which I think is, is, is tragic. I think to, to produce facts and to have knowledge to go Money, you know, it's all important. So all these are just pictures to enrich your mind and say, okay, if I do resilience work, now where do I have to Go to where can I pay the person? So that's the four dimensions, the anthropology. We have it in the videos. And uh, you know, if you really do <coughs> resilience work, it's also good to see now what is going on with the person. In medicine, medicine, they call it psychology, they call it anamnestics. See, what is going on? Yeah. It may help to know all those funny books, ICD-11 or DSM-5 or whatever. I don't like it, but I think there's lots of work done in there. So if you do resilience with somebody who is heavy to smoke and drinker, maybe very different to somebody who's doing it now, whatever. And also, in your mind, of course you can give a prognosis. Usually you would tell the person, well, if you do this, you die soon, stupid. But you can ask him, so, well, who are the best medical people that you trust? And what do you think of them? What do they, what do they think about your lifestyle? <coughs> then you get closer to his soul. But whatever. And also, this is where, where we are very good in LMP, I believe, are seeing the patterns. What is repeating repeatedly? What is coming again and uh, again and again? Behavior patterns, thinking patterns, patterns with you, patterns with the life, whatever. Uh, beliefs, I have, it must, I have to. But belief chain, beliefs are in there. It's all inputs for resilience work. And the way the client interacts with you is a matter for, for what? Uh, is the client submissive or aggressive or arrogant or whatever? What, what story is the client working here? It also can lead you to what's the story where we have to, to work to resilience on and all this stuff. Yeah. 
nice power point. Yeah. So, <laughs> so all these things are well to think about. Big, we had a very heated discussion yesterday evening, a lot of interesting political stories. Mm -hmm. And she said uh, that when somebody comes in, lots of stories go in my head. Yes, that's a story. Maybe more. So if you work with resilience, a uh, lot of things you don't talk. You think, you check, and then you'll find a good answer, the good question. So that's the general idea that we use in NLP, NLP therapy, to work also with patients with resilience. So any questions? Comments, questions? 